This is not a lecture. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is just we meet to have a coffee together. I'm having a tea. And we'll just chat about the icons. It's not a lecture at all. Are you an Egyptologist? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not an Egyptologist, and I'm not even an iconist. <laughs> no moment. <clears throat> but, but I spent a couple of years studying all sorts of historical arts, so I managed to touch the subject some time ago. So since we're going to St. Catherine's and we will experience this presence of old icons, I thought, how about we talk about the icons before we go there? And funny enough, we are first in Luxor, so we'll be around the Egyptian arts, and there's so many similarities between icons and, and Egyptian art that we can uh, mention here and have in mind that the pattern is applicable here and there somehow. But, good morning. So, uh, we're going to St. Catherine's and this is the place that we're going to see. And uh, St. Catherine's is special because, as Ross told you already, the icons there were untouched by people who were destroying icons at some point of the history, which I will tell you about. So what you'll experience there is unique. And today I will just try to give you a clue what is there, not there, but in icons, the most we appreciate. Why are they so unique and why are they so <coughs> different than all the other arts that we experience? An icon. The word comes from Greek, as most of the words we use, <laughs> and it basically means an image. Um, thinking of an icon word, we have desktop icons, we have an icon as a celebrity, we have icons as, a, as a paintings or as art we know. An icon is something special, isn't it? Especially if we say, he became an icon. He became something special. And so icon is something that we appreciate, that is uh, something that we have some image behind it, build up. It's more than just this, just what you see. And this is exactly what an icon is. An icon is not just a painting. An icon is a representation of what it represents. So it's more, it's your connection to the God to the saints that it depicts. An icon is more than you have just, it's not, it's not a simple image, okay? But where it started? This is San Lucas, San, San Luke. So he was Christ's student. And he was the first and the only one who was allowed to paint Virgin Mary. And this is, according to the legend, the first icon ever painted and this is the only image of Virgin Mary. This is how we know what she looked like. Because him, and being an artist, a painter, uh, surrounding the Christ and being with him, and of course Christ's uh, mother traveled with them. So they, they knew her and he was the one who painted her. So San Luke is a patron of artists, and this is where the icon started sort of. So if you see this picture here, you know that you're looking at some look. Because he's always shown in the art as painting the Virgin Mary. See? When we look at the, the, the art of, uh, of Christianity, you always see the saints depicted in a cer certain way. This is the rule. So this is how we recognize who there is in the picture. Ross one day mentioned Peter and Paul and because uh, they are, one is bold, one is not, and this is how we recognize them. Everyone has got something that you will recognize them by. Sam Luke is the one that was a painter. <clears throat> this might be a start of an icon, or this. This painting here, that's Hans Memling, so don't, don't take it as an icon, it's just uh, an image to tell you the story about uh, Veronique, walking along with Christ when he was carrying his, um, his cross. And she handed him a, a cloth so he could wipe the, the sweat off his face. And the image of his face remained on the cloth, on the veil. And this became uh, something that we call Veraikon, which is a true image. 
this face that you can see here is one of the typical um, patterns um, for icons. The, the image that remained after Jesus wiped his face became a, a sacred image and then was believed to create all sorts of miracles and uh, from there we think of icons as those images that can create miracles and we take them as something special and sacred. So icons, they are a little bit as not created by humans. Whoever is making an icon, he is actually just a tool in hands of God. An icon is something that takes you through and gets and takes you to connect with God. So this is this is why we don't call the painters that make icons. We don't call them painters. We call them the writers. They are not artists. They are actually kind of a monks that make a work for God. But they are not painters. So whatever they do they are directed by some rules and the, the input, the artistic input from there is very limited. Because they, their task is to put into an image the idea of God and what is there in the heaven and just help you to connect. So when you look at the icon, you're not looking at the art. Although, of course, each icon writer will have their, his own style, and you will be able to even recognize this is ma made by this one, this is made by that one, but that's just for the newest icons. Because an icon was always anonymous. Because you are not embracing yourself as an artist when you make an icon. You're serving God. So this is why all the, all the old icons, they have no, no uh, altar. Thinking about the icon, you have to think of the light that is coming through. This is why all icons, they are golden. The gold that you see in the icon, that's the heavenly light. That's the, God of, that's the light of God. Every time you see an icon, this is how you recognize it. It's gold, and it's a real gold most of times. If it's not gold, this is because someone was poor enough to replace gold with yellow color. But if it is an icon, then you will see golden background, okay? And that golden background is that transcendence between, between us and heaven. Oh, Brooks, that's your aroma. Yeah, Ava said that her English reading was, wasn't as good, so she asked me to do this. Um, thou who hast so admirably imprinted thy features on the cloth sent to King Abgar of Edessa, and hast so wonderfully inspired Luke, thy evangelist, enlighten my soul and that of thy servant, guide his hand that he may reproduce thy features, those of the Holy Virgin and of all thy saints, for the glory and peace of thy holy church. Spare him from temptations and diabolical imaginations in the name of thy mother, Saint Luke, and all the saints. Amen. The painter or the icon writer is blessed by God and he lives special life in order to be able to paint icons. You can't just be a random artist. You have to be educated and you have to have a proper life in order to be an icon writer. So these are some of the rules, not all of them, some of the rules that apply in order to make an icon, to be an icon writer. So first of all, you pray. Your life has to be pure. You pray before you make an icon. When you work, you work thinking of Lord himself. Every detail you, you make, you think of the one that you are, you are now um, depicting, the one you, you're showing. You pray and you, be, you are pure. So <clears throat> you feast and um, <clears throat> When, which, what, whatever move you make, it's always thinking about the task that you are given and you're blessed with the task. So the life of icon writers is kind of a monk's life. 
they study before they can actually do their work. They are well prepared and they are blessed. And among the society, they are the, the, the chosen ones. They are the special ones that actually can do their work. And as you can see, do not be jealous of the neighbor's work because we are all creating something for God and for us to pray with. And when your icon is finished, thank God for the work that you were able to do for him. And the icon, every time it's, when it's finished, it's blessed by the priest. So it becomes a, a sacred image. And then you, as an icon writer, you pray in front of it as first. So as you can see, being an icon writer is a task kind of a given by God, and you're special when, you, when you're allowed to do that. So this all, and this matter of an icon being something that connects you, there's, in an icon, that's just an image that you can see, but the importance is way below, be, above that. It's, it's further there. So this is an icon, this is something that you, you take as, as something to worship, maybe even. And then, there comes a problem. Because if you are thinking of an icon as something that is saying sacred, and made uh, especially by an uh, icon writer, blessed by the priest, and it's your connection to the God, then you're just half a step away from worshiping a matter. And this is actually what happened. And Christianity has always had problems with idolatry. And the problem didn't even start in 8th century that I will tell you just now about. It started just, just in the 2nd century, just after the Christianity following the Christ's life and death was created. The problem, if we should show God, God's face, have something to worship to help us worshiping him or we should not this is why we have a, a fish um, sign as the, the symbol of Christianity in order not to show God's face but it's so tempting isn't it so 5th 6th century this is the time where the icons were, were very very strong and then we really started to kind of worship icons so we lose the balance between who we are actually worshiping, and this is what was happening. The icons, you know, they can be carried around with the procession. We can, we have them at home. We will light a candle. We bow in front of the icon. We are silent in front of an icon, and then we kind of start to feel this is something that is sacred. So where is God? Am I praying to the God, or am I worshiping an icon? And this problem is always present with Christianity and all the other religions. Because even if you have something that is sacred for you, you will not destroy it. You will treat it especially. And this is what happens with these little pictures of God, of St. Mary, of Virgin Mary, of saints. We start to think of, you will not destroy an image of Virgin Mary. You will not throw it to the garbage, will you? But it's just an image. It's not, it's not her, herself. This problem became quite big. So in the 8th century, there was uh, an emperor in Byzantine um, em empire who knew this thing here. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. You shall not adore them nor serve them. So knowing this as the first and the main commandment, how do we take the icons? How do we treat them? Shall we depict the God or not? And this problem, we were struggling as Christianity. We were struggling with it many, many times. One of the examples where someone came over and said, this is wrong. This is all wrong. You're bowing, you're, you're on your knees, and you're actually having an idol instead of thinking God. So Emperor Leo III came over and said, done, no more, no more like this. Take that painting away, put the cross instead, and stop worshiping those paintings. So what happened? The first serious iconoclasm took place. That was the 8th century, 
and it caused, caused all sorts of problems. Of course, the political reasons were involved. But the thing is that at that time, there was an eruption of a volcano. And he was thinking, OK, so God is mad at us because we started to think of those items, those matter, more than of God. And this is how all hell broke loose. <laughs> this image, this shows you not the iconoclasm from that century. This is what happened centuries after, because after the 8th century, there was the 9th century, the 10th century, and Martin Luther, when he said, we need to change everything, he caused another iconoclasm as well. So this one is actually the 16th century image, but it shows you what was going on after. Someone said, icons are wrong. Throw them to the garbage. So they started, of course, to take the icons away. And this is why St. Catherine's is so unique. Because they didn't reach St. Catherine's, as Ross told you. They never went there to destroy icons. Most of the 6th, 7th uh, century icons are gone because of Leo III and his iconoclasm. Because people started to really raise their voices and said, let's get rid of all this stuff. And all these sacred icons that were worshipped with, with candles and bowing in front were gone. This is how it looked like, or could have. But on the other hand, there is this thought. We are not actually worshipping icons, because the thing is, if God is himself, how could you show his face? How can you depict it? But then there's two guys coming over. One is St. John Damascus, the other is St. Theodore the Student. And they say, well, wait, 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 wait. God had a son, and the son was real. He was human. He had blood. He had, he had face. He had, he had friends, and he died. So how could we not be able to make a painting of him? He was real. So if God put himself into the human body, we can actually make an image of that human body. So we are entitled to make painting of Mary, of saints, of Jesus, because he was real, he was alive. And this was the main argument, the main reason for um, them to say, icons are fine. Of course, we should not worship icons, the matter in itself, but we are not. We are just using the icon to send our mind and our heart further there. So these two guys were very, very strong in their in that argument. And uh, any representation of the living person, not God himself, but the living person, should be allowed. So after years, exactly in 787, because it, it all started in 726, uh, this iconoclasm of, of Leo III. So it took like 60 years, and after that time they said, well, maybe we were actually wrong. So at that time, in the Ecumenial Council of Nice, they said, so iconoclasm was actually wrong. That was, that was a mistake, sorry for that. We are uh, taking it back. <laughs> and then we will still be making icons, we will be worshipping them. Just remember, it's not about the icon, it's about the God that is beyond there. And we are putting rules onto icons. How shall we make icons? So there were even more standardized things then. So, what was said? We have to keep in mind that the icon is a representation of God and it sends us away to heaven, yes? So we are not actually trying to have an icon as a realistic, naturalistic image. It's not about that. It's about representing something more than our human bodies and lives. So, it has to be flat. We don't need the chiaroscuro effect. No highlights, shadows, no realistic effects in there. We don't need it. Because what we are showing is actually something beyond humanity, something more. It can be realistic. Because it's just a clue that, that takes you to the feeling of heaven. Inverse perspective. You will notice it when you look at the architecture in the, in the icons, that the perspective is completely not what we are used to with, uh, with uh, after, after Renaissance perspective. It's because it's reversal, because we are the ones that are in the center. We are the point of view. So it serves to drag us, to take us into that reality. Now we become the part of what's in the image. 
the icon takes us there to the to heaven. And there's the, the, the representations are unfass and they are very static. There's no facial ex expression. Eyes are big. Now why? First of all, there's not a smile, not a sad face, because the icon or whoever is in the icon, they take part in your life. Whenever you cry, they cry along with you. When you smile, they smile with you. They they take part in the life. So the face has no real expression because then you can um, you can feel that they're with you whatever happens and they are there in heaven so they are most transcendent more transcendent if they have no real real look big eyes they they it's because they look at god they are looking at you from from uh, the heaven and then the long nose because they smell the smell of the paradise and then the slim fingers, because they don't have to touch anything. They fragile because they are already beyond the material world. And um, no shadows, no co the, the contours are strong. The, the no shadows thing is, how could there be any shadow? How could there be any lack of light if there is a God's light all over? They are not light, and they're, they're, they're not in the reality where the sun is creating shadows and lights. They are in the world, in the space where the world is filled with God's light. And this golden, golden space around, this is the God's light. So there can't be any shadow, because the God's light is everywhere. So this is why we look at the icons and we think, this is kind of primitive art, isn't it? It's not. All those artists that were not artists, were just icon writers, they could paint those icons in a way that would be a natural, naturalistic, realistic, but they can't. Because this is just something that is a symbol. And this is how icons, with this idea, are similar to Egyptian art. When you see those Egyptian paintings, you think, okay, this is weird. Should, the, the body doesn't work like this and the same happens there a big eye and the body twisted in those strange serpentines because we need to show the most of the body and then all the gestures and everything that is happening in the Egyptian art is due to the idea that what we are trying to say with with that image it's not that they, they didn't know how to paint it's just that they had rules that they had to apply. The same here. They had rules that they had to apply. The strong contour, the flatness, the perspective, they are all messages to you. They are not mistakes. Technically, the, the oldest ones and the ones that we will be blessed to see in St. Catherine's because they survived are the ones that are made with encaustic uh, technique. And I will not, I will not tell you with all these details, but this is the wax. So we have the hot wax, the beeswax. You, you mix it with uh, the, the pigment, and then with the kind of a spoon, you put it when it's hot on the surface of the, of the, of the painting. This is what makes this encaustic um, icons very difficult to preserve. Many that survived were destroyed afterwards by people who tried to refresh them and they destroyed them because wax you know what happens to wax when you start to put uh, chemicals on it's gone so there was a couple of years ago not that not that long time ago there was a famous spanish icon that was this or painting that was destroyed by a lady who went to the church and tried to tried to clean it and she completely destroyed it because this was actually a wax that she treated in the wrong way so the, the encaustic, um, encaustic ones, they are made with colored wax and they are the most, uh, the, the oldest ones. That's the 5th, 6th uh, century. After this, there comes the distemper. And distemper, this is the, the, the one that is most popular for icons. And not only for icons, many paintings during the medieval ages, medieval era were done like this. It's way before oil painting came to the stage. Mosaic, you will see many of them. And this is the other way of making an icon. 
all came long after this. All came into the stage of icons, 18th, 19th century. So if it's an all, a painting, all icon, you'll know that it's quite new. Well, let's go to the how we make an icon. And I'm telling you this, because when you find out how long this process is, when you look at icon, you will see how much of the work was put in. We choose the tree. Not all the trees are fine for icons. Okay, we have the tree. We chop the tree. We make big packs. And now what we do with them? We have to steam them. So we have that huge pot. We put the water, we put the, 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 the fire underneath, and then the plugs above, put together, and then we steam it before we dry the, the, the wood. After we have steamed it, so in English, so the steam comes through, and then we dry them. How do we dry them? First, we put them into the bread oven. Just after we take the bread out of the oven, we put the plugs in. And we let the oven cool down. We take the plugs out and we hang them around in the room, in the attic, where there is a flow of the fresh air and smoke. And we leave them for a couple of years, three to five years. So we're quite patient. So if you have a tree in your garden, you won't have an icon of it. No rush. Just we take we take our time. So we have them the, them smoked dried, and now we can chop them into the shape that we need. Icon can be this big, or it can be a whole altar. So we chop them into the proper size, and then we boil them in the linseed oil. Boiling them in the oil will prevent all the, well, the, the, the smoke here will, pre, will get rid of all the bugs. Now the oil will close the wood and it will prevent it from getting um, moist. So you boil it in that oil as long as the, the air still pops up. When you see that there's no, no air bulbs on the surface of oil, your wood is ready to use. So those wooden plants now, after boiling them in the oil, we put together, we create a size, a frame that we need. We put them together and how we make a frame. In the new days, you can just put the frame on top, but normally what would you do? You take those, the plugs have to be really, really big because you want to carve a surface out so the frame will be just remaining around. It's not that we frame as a, as the frame is not um, additional, addition to your plugs. It's something that is just take away, you carve out the surface and the frame remains around. What we do next? <clears throat> we have a glue and the glue would be made of bones, skins, most of times it will be an animal glue. So you put a couple of surfaces of glue, and each surface you put, you wait until it dries and you polish. And then again. And then again. So having this prepared, we are ready to put the... We, still, we will still have, we will take the canvas, like the, you know, the linen canvas, we will dip it in the in gesso, in uh, gypsum, in uh, some kind of, uh, it's called paint vehicle. And we will just cover whole, whole plug, whole surface with it. We just wrap it up. We wrap our, our future icon in the canvas. And now having this, we again put the glue and the polish. Put the glue and polish. We polish with the stone, okay? After having that couple of surfaces, couple of layers of glue, we can actually start to prepare our gesso. <laughs> so after having this canvas glued, we will put, it can be either chalk or gypsum gesso on. You put one surface, you polish, and how you check if it's polished well. You take a cold powder, you use 
spray it all around your canvas. You shake it well and you check if the coal is remained on the surface. If there is none piece of the coal of the powder, the black powder on your canvas, it's polished well. If there is any coal remaining on the surface, you polish it more. And you put five or seven layers like this. So it's a gesso, which is a, a, like a in the, the, the white surface, yes? And then, then the coal and then again. Having this done, you're ready to start to make your icon. It's been a couple of months already. How do we make an actual painting? First of all, you have to know that there is no such thing as you come up with an idea of what we're going to put into our painting. It's always by the pattern that you're given. You're educated to write an icon so you know what are the patterns. So we have a site that we want to make. How do you make a sketch? There's two ways. You take the paper and you make dots. You make a little hole uh, as a sketch. Yes, so you, you make the little holes that will be the contours of what's going to appear. You put that paper with those holes on top of your nicely done canvas and then you take a coal powder uh, in the little sack. And you, and you tap it, and then the coal drops through those holes and remains on your canvas. And this is how you have your contour. That's one way. The other way would be, uh, 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 you have to remember the Polish word. It's called przeprucha. <laughs> and the, the other way would be the calc. So you take the calc, you, you put and the coal all over the calc and then you put it on your canvas and you press where the contour should be and of course the contour remains on your canvas so these are the two ways and only the masters of the masters actually were taking a pencil and drawing their uh, sketch on the canvas only the masters of the masters the, the regular icon writer would always make it accordingly to the pattern and first put it on the paper or the calc and make the contour like this. What's next? Remember the golden parts are the ones that depict the gold and it's a real gold. You have gold flakes and if you are the master you make the golden flakes, uh, the golden flakes yourself or you just buy them you put the gold first. So the gold will be in the nymphs and in the background. That's, and the order of putting these things on the, on the icon is always the same, you cannot break that rule. So it's golden flakes or golden powder on the backgrounds and nymphs. And then when you have this one done, you can actually go to painting. But the order has to be always the same. So you can start with all the backgrounds background one is gold but some parts of the architecture sceneries will be not gold so you paint this one first then you make the architecture all the buildings that might appear there you make the landscape and then you can go to clothes and the last one will be the skin about the architecture you will many times notice when you look at the icons that the perspective is all ruined the same place, like the same building, will have three different perspectives within it. And this is because we look at that scene as the God sees it. The God sees it from everywhere, so it doesn't matter. It's not the human point of view, it's the God's point of view. So if you look at this, the, the scene that is in your icon and you get confused where actually we're looking from, we're looking from everywhere. And it's the same, why do we see the same person three times in, in the same icon? Different, different um, events that are depicted in the same icon. The God sees it like, throughout time. So it doesn't matter if this one happened first or this one happened after. What matters is the most important people 
in the icon will be the biggest ones. And again, this is the same as in the Egyptian art <coughs> and all the other arts. The most important people are always the biggest ones and are in the front. The perspective, the other way of showing the perspective will be what's further from us is above. Or, of course, the, the angels, the, 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 the sky, the heaven will be on top of the, of, on top of the frame. Back here. <coughs> the, and this, people say, okay, this is how we make an icon, but this is actually this technique. The, the distemper technique will not let you do it otherwise, uh, differently. So it's always starting with dark tones and going to the brighter ones. So whatever is the darkest, you put on your, on your um, painting first. If it's the skin, if it's the, the clothes, you put the dark tones first, and then you'll go to the brighter and brighter. So this is how the, 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 the face appears, or anything else. You have the, the dark stains, and you start to fill them in with the brighter and brighter um, parts. So the white, the white paint that you'd use to, to show the, the, the leaks, the highlights, will be the last one. At this stage, when you finish all the painting, you can show it to the priest and he can bless it. And after it's blessed, you put the varnish on. So the varnish will make the colors darker especially with time. So if you see that the icon is really, really dark, you almost cannot see what's in it, it means that it's really, really old because the varnish becomes really, really dark with years and cracks. So the cracks, when you see them on the oil painting or other, any other painting, the cracks are because of the varnish. So if there is a painting that has got no cracks on it, it means that it has got no varnish on, on top. And then there comes the dress. You will see many times that there is a, a silver metal dress, like a cover. It can cover all the painting, all the icon, or just some parts. So many times what was painted actually was only the face, the face and hands. And all the rest, the dress of, for example, in this case, the dress of the Virgin Mary and everything surrounding her, would be made of metal. So you can have an icon that is fully painted and then just covered with that metal dress, or it's not even fully painted because the painted parts are only the visible ones because it's designed already with the dress. Sometimes you will have the metal cover that will cover all of the frame and this is to prevent it from the eyes of people and it will be shown to us only on special occasions. So when you walk into the church, you see that it's, there, there must be a painting there, but it's all metal. And of course, it's beautifully carved with wonderful stones, and it's all shiny and nice, but it actually hides what's underneath, because that underneath is too important to be shown every day. It has to be shown only on special occasions. And now, of course, everything that appears in your icon has got a meaning. The colors, they will always have a meaning. And the colors, they apply to uh, medieval art, not only to icons. So, for example, if it's blue, blue is a uh, divinity, the heaven. Red, that's humanity, that's blood. So, for example, when you see a Jesus, and Jesus got, has got this um, code, which is blue on the outside, red on the inside because he is from heaven, but he's got a human body. So this is the symbol of his both natures. If, if it's red, then for example, the, the martyrs, they will be dressing, uh, wearing red because of the, the sacrifice they make for us, the blood that they, that they make uh, pour out for us. The green, that will be the, 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 the clothes of them if they give hope because they make us, they, they do things for us, for our uh, safe, uh, safety. And then the purple, that will be always some emperor, some, someone wealthy in the purple. If it's brown, that will be a monk, that will be a beggar, 
of be someone that is that is um, poor, and white will be pure and innocence. So when you see the colors, the colors will guide you through the story that you see, and you'll know that okay, this is someone that is from heaven. This is someone that is important, and so on. So look at the colors and see what they tell you in the, in your icon. And uh, as we said, there are types of icon. There are there are patterns to follow. I'll show you just some that are most uh, popular. Talking about Christ, the Christ, Christ the Pantocrator, will be the one that is sitting, maybe on the cloud, maybe on the throne. That doesn't matter, and he is blessing you. So this is the typical, typical, and the most uh, popular one. This hand is that that one gives you blessing. Okay, so this is one of the the most important ones, and this is actually the one that you will see in some Catholics. This is the 6th century encaustic Christ. And as you can see, he is quite realistic. It's before the, the Council in Nice said they have to be so unreal. This one follows the, the type of the very icon I showed you, the Veronique's veil. So the head, the head of Christ, just like this, just face. This is the, the source for it, that's the veil of Veronique. The, the one when she gave him to wipe his face when he was tired carrying the cross. And this one here is called the Aziz. You have the Christ here, sitting on the throne. And there is Virgin Mary and Saint John. And they are standing next to the Christ and they are praying for us. So this is why they have hands together and they look uh, um, at Jesus and they are actually here um, asking, being there for us. Okay, so these are uh, they are our messengers to ask him for our lives. Okay? And then Mother of God, Mary. These are the very typical ones, and we know them. The mercy when she's showing us the tenderness with Jesus, cheek to cheek with Jesus, the, the baby. This is how we see this uh, human human side of his of his life, the human connection, the mother and son love. This is when we are informed that he was really a human, and there's a love in between the mother and the baby, just as they are, the human nature of God. In here, Hodegetria, this is one of the really really um, popular ones. This is when she is showing him as the only path in life. So she will always be pointing at him as saying, this is your only way in life, this is your path. And then the third one, the Oranta, when she's praying and her hands are up, she's got little cheeses on her heart and she's praying for us and it's been told that when she puts her hands down, when she stops praying for us, that will be the end of the world. So, so so far she is standing with her hands up and she is praying for us, for our mercy. These are the six, the most uh, popular ones, but you'll see many, many of them, because in the icons you can see uh, uh, angels, the Gabriel, all saints, all sorts of events from, the, from Jesus' life that can be depicted there. The rule is always the same. They will be showing you something that is a message and the you will be connected to whatever is depicted there. And this is how you should feel this not materialistic world, but something that is beyond. Iconostas is that something, that something else that is about the icons, and these were actually the ones that were destro being destroyed during iconoclasm, and they uh, caused the most of trouble. Iconostas is the wall made of icons that is put in the church, in the Greek Catholic Church, you see them, and they divide the church. This is the divine space, and this is the human space, so we cannot cross. We stay always in front here. Behind there, only the ones who are entitled can go through. So the, the main door is the God's door, so some of, uh, some of priests can walk through on special occasions, but normally, 
will have the door on the sides, and this is when, where people can go through. And this has got as um, a meaning. I am not going to teach you about what iconostasis built of. This is just to show you that each part of it has got a meaning. So they are, these are rows, yes, and there's a parts, there's a turn central part, side parts, and each of those has got a meaning and it will be always the same. As the S's will always be here, the last supper will be, oh, that's Polish OW, that's, that's for the last supper, the mystery supper. So the supper will be always here and you will always have the cross out above there and each part of the iconostasis, they will always have some meaning and this is the pattern again that is followed. So when we walk to the church, and if you, if you want me, I can, I can share this one with you sometime later. With this scheme here, you will always know which picture, which icon is about what. Because this is always follow the rule, okay? And just to put a little bit more of the anticipation, this is the example of what we're going to see in St. Catherine's. That's my favorite one. This is the letter to heaven, and you can see the dark forces, they shoot us on our way there, and not all of us can reach the sky. The Gabriel, the Arch Arch Archangel Gabriel, he's always, he's always in red. Thank you.